Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In this episode we're going to have a look at this Sega CD add-on for the original Sega Genesis console. This came out in 1992 and uh, gave you access to a uh, CD uh, which of course had much greater storage than cartridges did, which is what the uh, Genesis used. and. Uh, at this point there was uh, most of these games were basically they played back FMVs and uh, just made use of the larger capacity of the CD but that was not all because the original Genesis console had a Motorola 68K running at about what 7.6 megahertz this one had a second 68K in it that ran on, at 12 and a half megahertz more memory and uh, essentially you ended up with a dual processor system and uh, the processors communicated through ports remember this is 92 it was basically parallel communication and it was it was kind of a nightmare to write code for this which I did but uh, ultimately it worked and you had two processors and mass secondary storage and you could play uh, full motion videos and all other stuff all other wonderful things like that to your heart's content I got this particular unit a while ago I bought it off eBay and it was sold as completely non-functional and it was completely non-functional now the reason I'm mentioning this is because that I bought it a while ago is I got this before I started this channel so whatever work needed to be done to this has already been done because I didn't have a channel yet but I will try to explain carefully what I fixed in here there seem to be common problems and uh, this should help you out e to either fix your own or if you're just interested to see what goes on inside one of these things stay tuned now remember this is an add-on so it needs an actual Genesis console now it goes here this is an original console and you can see there's quite a bit of overhang here and uh, uh, you, you have to get a special adapter plate for it so it mounts here properly and I think they also give you a plastic piece that extends this but that's because this is a Genesis 1 and this is a Sega CD 2 uh, so it looks kinda real ghetto when you put that in here there was a Sega CD 1 which fit underneath this and kind of match this but uh, but ones uh, Sega CD ones were not very good in quality are very expensive now see if that makes any sense to you and uh, so I ended up the, the the best the cheapest deal I could find was a tube which is functionally identical but looks different now how do we solve that is and what we do is we use a Genesis console model the second generation which fits in here nicely this came with a plate already that uh, that lets you slide securely slide it into the base of the CD and then we have the uh, edge connector over here which makes the connection to the CD unit When I bought this unit, it did come with this particular uh, uh, Genesis 2 with the mounting plate and everything underneath. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, when I hooked it up, and you need uh, you need two separate power supplies, one for this, one for this, they don't power each other. And uh, I put in the power supplies and uh, the Genesis powered up, but the Sega CD did not. There's an access light on it. Uh, there's a, is that a window. I want to see. No, that's not a transparent window. But I couldn't hear the CD spinning in here, telling me that this unit was completely dead. Now the first thing that we should probably do is before testing anything, is to make sure since we're dealing with two separate components here, let's let us make sure that the actual Genesis console works and then we'll go ahead and open the uh, CD up 
and see what's going on in there. When I bought this it came with no cables, it was a uh, no cords included deal. Power isn't too big of a deal, it's a center positive center positive uh, 9 volt supply. So that's not a big deal. Just a barrel connector that I had to switch polarity on because originally it was the wrong polarity. But the video cable of course is has a proprietary plug like this. Kind of an S video derivative. Of course I didn't have one but nowadays you can get these cables pretty cheaply on eBay so two days later my problem was solved. So we have an AV connection, we have the power of course and the most important of all we need a game and uh, I thought we'd try Zombies Ate My Neighbors. So it powers up and uh, it looks like the console itself is in working condition. So this is good. All right, so uh, let's turn our attention to the CD drive now. So here's the bottom of the unit. There's six screws around the perimeter, Phillips screws holding it together. Uh, there's even a phone number if you need help. So. Uh, I guess if I get stuck I can always call that phone number. But the top should now lift off and uh, you can see it comes off cleanly. There really isn't anything connecting it to the uh, other half. And here's our unit. There's the drive and uh, the electronics are underneath here, the big connector. And let's see, what else can we point out? Not much at this point. So we're going to have to get the inner assembly out next. So in order to get the guts out, there are no external screws. They're all here holding the PC boards and the connector in place. Here we can of course see the drive itself and I think what I'm going to do, or what I already did, it's connected through a single ribbon cable here without latches. So I'm going to pull that out and set it aside. Next we have the uh, top of the RF shield that once you remove all of the screws will come out and uh, that shows you quite a lot of ICs in here but we need to take this board out uh, to see why it's not getting any power. I don't have any schematics I don't think I need any yet at this point because uh, you just follow power and, and see where it stops. So the board is free, you pull it slightly forward so the connectors in the back clear the uh, case cutouts. And the whole tray slides out. Now I poked around and uh, pretty much just followed the uh, power input and saw where it disappeared. And as you can see, here's my handiwork already. I found this rather large fuse surface mounted which was open. 
Now, rumor, not ru well, rumor has it that one of the easiest ways to blow this fuse is to put in a power supply of uh, the uh, wrong polarity. And uh, that seems to blow this fuse. So I don't know whether this fuse blew because of that. I mean, it's just using a standard barrel connector. Uh, well, that's the Gen 2, actually. Let me pull my temporary supply. It uses this kind of a supply. I use the universal supply so I get the polarity right and could select the voltage on it. Or if uh, this thing blew up because something was drawing too much power, because that's normally what the problem is, well, uh, I guess we'll find out. For that reason, I did not go ahead and replace the fuse. I left the dead fuse in place. And the reason for that is, is it provides me with uh, convenient terminals here to solder on a fuse that is more easily replaced. And so what I did was I mounted the fuse over screws falling out. But I mounted an external fuse in the case making sure that it cleared the uh, the uh, CD drive and it's just the standard fuse holder and, the, and again the reason I did that is I don't know whether this fuse blew because of a wrong polarity power supply or if there was something else wrong with it and I didn't want to go ahead and replace the surface mount fuse just to find out that uh, the minute I plugged it in it would blow again because there was something else wrong on the board here's a 68k by the way and uh, but with that done it was time to check it out. The way to put the guts back in, and I'm telling you this because I found out the hard way, is, uh, I mean, this, this should be, the PC board should be separated. You want to put in the bottom of the shield first, and then slide the uh, board connectors through the holes in the case and then set that down into place. And now everything's back in again. And the next thing to do is to put the uh, CD drive in and power the whole thing up. So what remains is uh, plug the CD drive back in carefully. Push aligning it and gently pushing it back into place and then sitting the uh, DVD drive back. Now I can't really test it this way because uh, there's no way I connect the Genesis to this and have it sitting on here and it also has a door latch detect switch over here so the best thing to do is Put the top of the shield back on. And the top of the case. Connect the Genesis. Remove the cartridge and then plug power and stuff in and see what happens. So everything's put together back uh, temporarily. Uh, I had to plug in the second power supply for the drive and uh, even though the power supplies I'm using which uh, you can see in the background there with the round labels on them are a little bit smaller than the originals but I guess it was so cumbersome that Sega actually released a special power strip where you could comfortably plug in both of the original power supplies and kind of have things out of the way instead of having those bricks uh, sitting in, in different outlets in the room or whatever. The system did not seem to be very well thought out of. But anyway, so everything's plugged in now. There is no CD in here. And we're just going to power it up right now. 
cartridge is out, of course, and uh, see what it does. Well, success was with me. Uh, lights blinking over here, obviously. There's no CD in there. But see those neat 3D effects. Those are all coming off of the 12.5 uh, meg processor in here. It was not possible to do that with the original Sega. And of course, typical FM music it played. But, so next, of course, I put in a CD. And what happened was pretty much nothing. Uh, well, nothing useful, I should say. What happened was I got, uh, the CD started to spin, but I got a horrible grinding sound. And it wasn't the uh, motor, the hub motor for the, uh, for the disc, because that started to spin and it sounded normal. But then when it started to seek, it made that grinding noise, which led me to believe that it had something to do with the stepper motor. So, good thing I didn't put the screws in and just left them out here, because obviously we got to go back in and now have a look at the CD drive. Now remember when I said earlier that on that uh, you couldn't really test it this way because it was difficult to put the Genesis on here without the top of the case to see what was going on and uh, anyway I did in order for me to find out where the grinding noise was coming from I did have to run it this way and I set up this Frankenstein like concoction where the Genesis was in here I padded it with insulating material from underneath I taped it down in place and uh, just in order to see or here where that grinding noise was coming from and uh, I'm not going to repeat that setup it's not really necessary for you to do that because if you hear the grinding noise I'm going to tell you where it's coming from and you don't have to go through all of this but uh, what it seemed like it was doing was that the CD and that was of course another issue because the CD uh, even though it clips into this hub, it uh, it's not a setup I would recommend to run the whole thing without the top cover here. But anyway, observing, putting the CD in, observing it, and uh, you know, putting my face close to this thing and expecting the CD to fly off and uh, gouge me at any minute, told me that what was happening was that the uh, the head can see over here was trying to retract to the center I guess to track zero of the CD and I moved the head out by hand and yes when you turned it on the head retracted but it wouldn't stop it kept retracting so what that told me was there's something in there most likely that is not it's waiting for a signal to tell it that the head has retracted but the processor never got that signal so it just continued retracting the head and I think what the grinding noise was coming from was that the gears over here were actually starting to slip because the head hit a hard stop couldn't move any anymore and uh, these gears just uh, and, and I hope it was designed to do that slipped has not to do any damage. I did observe all the teeth in here, they're all still, it has all its teeth, doesn't need to go to the dentist, but uh, the point was of course why is it, why does it keep trying to retract it? So I was gonna visually inspect it and see if I could see how it detected the head, uh, the, the head position. So I stared at the CD drive and uh, it looked like I found how it was detecting the end of stroke, so to speak, on the uh, on the head assembly, and you can see over here there is a simple uh, vertical leaf switch right here, and uh, covered with a plastic 
a transparent plastic housing, which is uh, function is twofold. First of all, they don't want the the uh, the head assembly actually touches the little plastic cover here instead of the switch itself. It moves. Let's see if I can get it to move. And if you look at it. I can't get this to show up, but if you move the head in, see there, it bends, that whole assembly bends outward, bends outwards, and that means that the switches, the leaf switches inside are now closed. Then when the head moves out again, in the other direction, it releases pressure on this and the switch opens again. Now. Uh, Obviously, the problem has something to do with that switch. So, uh, looking underneath, it is simply soldered in here. It's just a switch. There really isn't anything else in there. But when I measured these terminals, yeah, when the switch is open, it was open. Uh, but when the switch was closed, I was getting several K of resistance, which was probably too high for the processor to detect switch closure. Now, a leaf switch, for those of you who don't know what it looks like, looks like this. This is a larger version. It comes out of a pinball machine. And uh, basically, this is actually the opposite of what the switch in the Sega is, because this one's normally closed. This is an end-to-stroke switch for flippers. And uh, when the flipper is pressed, it opens up the contact. Whereas the one in the Sega actually looks like this in the rest position, and when the head goes to track zero, it pushes the two contacts together. So looking at that, uh, looking at the contacts, and they were much smaller than this, and this is a common problem in older and newer pinball machines too, is that basically the contacts uh, get corrosions on them get corrosion and uh, they don't properly conduct anymore. Now in this case, you know, I assume it's just a switch closure, there's very little current going through it. And after I looked at the switch, which of course I can't show you right now, but it looks very similar to this with the two leaves and then the uh, contacts, uh, there seemed to be black deposits on it, so I think dirt had gotten in. The best way to fix something like that is to take a business card uh, put some uh, isopropyl alcohol on it and uh, slide it in between the contacts gently so you don't bend the leaves. Push the contacts together with your fingers and just kind of clean in, 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 the, in between, clean the actual contacts themselves. And that stuff comes off if you lose a you use a white or lighter colored card cardstock, you will see black marks starting to appear on both sides, which means it's uh, taking off the dirt on the contacts. That's causing it not to con to conduct properly. And after repeating that a couple of times, using a clean section of the card every time, you'll see that there's no longer any dirt coming off. And at that point, you know that the switch is clean. And that's exactly what I did with the switch inside the DVD in the, the CD drive. The problem I had here was I had no way to get to the switch. I mean, on top of it being very close to the top PC board, it also has that plastic cover around it. There was no way to get in. So uh, what I had to do was uh, desolder it. It only has these two contacts. Make a note of orientation before you do that. It is not uh, universal, but rather uh, you need to orient it properly. And all I can tell you, it's hard to see here, take a picture of it, or three, before taking it out. Then, because there's so little space between the top board, you kind of got to finagle it out with, with uh, pliers or very carefully, you, you got to take this thing out and once you have this thing out, the plastic cover actually slides away from the switch and you end up seeing the actual contacts. You go ahead and clean the contacts just like I showed you before 
be careful, be gentle, because those are very small contacts. They're easy to uh, uh, damage and bend. And once you're done, slide the plastic cover back on, put it back into place, re-solder the two connectors, and then go ahead and measure the switch. After I did it, I measured the switch, and I got less than 50 ohms when it was closed, and uh, that looked good enough to me. So, on to the, la to the next test and see if that fixed our problem. I just noticed that there's another switch here, and that's the one that detects latch closure of the uh, CD door. It's mounted here. It's, again, it's hard to show because the uh, camera won't focus if I go much closer, but you'll see the leaf standing upright, and it has the plastic box over here. This has an additional back stop here, uh, and uh, when the latch closes, it presses on this, and you can see, you can see the contacts near the top over here as they close. So it's the same principle. That is a source of another problem because on some uh, Segas, you put a CD in, you close the uh, CD door, and it'll go, please insert CD. There's a very high probability that what happened to my uh, track position switch can also happen to this switch. So just go ahead and measure the resistance on it, both, you know, when it's closed, and if it's too high of a resistance, again, higher than 50 ohms or whatever when it's closed, it's dirty, and you've got to go through the same procedure, which is very similar to what I did before, and that is desoldering this, getting off the uh, top plastic cover, and then cleaning the contacts and putting it all back again. Well, let's see how successful the repairs were. So, uh, let's start up this guy. All right, still boots up. And shows up the beautiful graphics effect. So uh, let's give a Sonic CD a try. This was one of the more or better received games that came out for this platform. Because rather than being an endless collection of low res videos, it actually offered some gameplay. Press start. CD-ROM. I can hear the drive. And success. Can it read the game? And there you go. And so on and so forth here. Great fun, but the game works. As you can see though, it's not... So this is interesting. It's not actually accessing the CD for graphics and for that's all loaded, but I think that the music is being streamed off because the access light over here is on permanently. Doesn't exactly sound like streamed music though, but bottom line is, it works. So, uh, that's great. But let's look for another example game. 
and one that actually plays videos, so you can come to appreciate the uh, intense quality that this CD gave the Sega system. Same logo. And there you go. Of course I'm playing it on a really small screen, so it doesn't really tell you truthfully how shitty the uh, resolution is. But it runs and uh, it's actually streaming it off the CD. So I think we got this thing fixed, it's working well, and uh, another thing to act, add to my collection of video games. Just look at that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, resurrection of the uh, Sega CD. Make sure to subscribe, leave me a comment, and tell me uh, what you thought about the whole thing, a thumbs up for my effort, and we'll see you really soon. Bye.